Good afternoon. Welcome to the Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for May 3rd, 2023. I am Gary Brunette from the Division of Workforce De Development. The Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds is sponsored by the CDC Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship and the Health Resources and Services Administration Bureau of Health Workforce. We, we use Zoom for the audio and presentation and the Q&A box to pose questions. Note, you can pose questions via the Q&A box at any point during the lecture and the speakers will work on answering them at their discretion. Note your name may appear associated with the question you posed. If you do not want your name to be associated with the question, then please check the submit anonymously box. Continuing education credits are available for the live course for up to one month after the presentation date and for the recorded version up to two years from the date. Uh, this can be obtained through CDC training and continuing education online portal. The course code for this grand rounds is all capital letters, CDC PMRF. If you have any questions, please contact the program. Today's grand rounds topic will be Recovery Kentucky, a successful model of addressing substance use abuse. We have two presenters, Michael Townsend, the Recovery Kentucky Administrator, and Dr. T.K. Logan, a professor at the University of Kentucky. The presentation will be approximately one hour with 30 minutes for questions and, after, and answers afterwards. I will hand off now to Mike Townsend. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate the opportunity to, to present this, um, this very um, unique model of Recovery Kentucky. Um, we've been operating this, this model for over 15 years. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, it was started um, through the Kentucky Housing Corporation under the leadership of former Governor Ernie Fletcher. Um, and in interestingly enough, Ernie Fletcher, who is a medical doctor, uh, was prior to being governor of Kentucky, was a, uh, an employee of CDC and served as senior medical advisor and chief health officer uh, with the organization. So he has a, a long history and, a, and a, um, a lot of admiration for the work of, of CDC. Each time I've, I've met with, with Governor Fletcher, because he's still involved in this, in this program, uh, he likes to recall some of his uh, uh, times with CDC. He's certainly a focus on preventive preventive medicine, and it comes through when we talk with with, with Governor Fletcher. So I want to talk about the the model, the, the Recovery Kentucky model. Um, although it was started through the Kentucky Housing Corporation in 2004, uh, it had a history that preceded that. It actually came out of a model that was initiated in Louisville, Kentucky, actually started by a Catholic priest who was trying to deal with homeless alcoholics on the streets of Louisville, Kentucky. He called the Jefferson County Medical Society and said, I need help. You all are doctors. You need, you need to come and help me deal with these men and women that are on the streets in downtown Louisville. Well, the Jefferson County Medical Society decided to take that on as a, as, a, as a mission, and they set up a program. They didn't know exactly what to do. They, were, they, were, they knew how to diagnose illnesses. They knew how to, to treat uh, physical and mental health issues, but they had no idea how to deal with men and women who were on the streets, homeless and, and intoxicated. Um, so they ended up hiring a gentleman that had just come out of the military, who had just received his master's degree in social work, who happened to be a recovering alcoholic. His name is Jay Davidson. Jay started a program in downtown Louisville called The Healing Place. He recruited men and women who were in recovery to help develop this mentoring program. They used an education model known as Recovery Dynamics, which is an it, a, a in-depth study of the big book. And then, and then they taught men and women to 
teach the program and mentor each other as they walk themselves through a new life of recovery. That program started in 1991. A few years later, the same problems were happening in, happening in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, they had a program for homeless men in, in Lexington. They were just frustrated because they couldn't, they, while they could give them food and clothing and a place to stay, they, the men and women just kept relapsing over and over again. And then they heard about this program in, Lex, in, in Louisville and they called and said, can you send somebody up to help us? We are frustrated. We don't know what to do with these men and women that are in that are uh, intoxicated and on the streets. And we're trying to provide a shelter for them. The healing place sent a person there and basically in uh, uh, replicated the the model, the the healing place model in Lexington at the Hope Center. It just so happened that the board of directors had a gentleman by the name of Don Ball. Don was a friend of the of the soon to be Governor Ernie Fletcher. When Governor Fletcher became the governor of Kentucky in 2004, he named Mr. Ball as the chairman of the board of the Kentucky Housing Corporation. Well, Mr. Ball was so enamored with the work and the recovery that both the Healing Place and the Hope Center had experienced with their men and women that he, and he was a visionary, and he said, I want to replicate this model throughout the state of Kentucky. I want to be, I want to invest in what we call tax, low income housing tax credits to build 10 recovery centers, 100 bed recovery centers that would be built with tax credits. That would be, we would have Section 8 housing. HUD would have to uh, sign off on this. And that we want to have an opportunity for men and women to recover from addiction rather than throwing them out of, the, of their housing because of their drinking and drug use. HUD was interested in helping us. We made it made it clear to the to HUD officials that if a person drank or used drugs while they were in this housing, that they could not stay in this in the housing. But we were about rehabilitating people and helping them change their lifestyles. So they they bought in, into the program, um, and the Department of Corrections came to us and said we are inundated with men and women that are in need of treatment. About 60 to 70 percent of the men in our prisons are men and women in our prisons are suffering from alcohol and drug use disorders. We need help. If you open these programs, we will send you men and women to to this program. So everything came together. The, the, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Local Government, the, the Kentucky Housing Corporation, and the governor's office. And believe me, when the governor's office says we're going to work together, we work together. But we did have the, the 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 involvement with HUD. They were very instrumental in supporting this model uh, to help men and women men and women recover from addiction. So in night in 2004, I had just re retired from state government. I had had a 30 year career in with the Department of Behavioral Health uh, in the Cabinet for Health and Family Services in Kentucky. I, I served as the state director for substance abuse services. I had uh, served my time and was. Uh, uh, off for a year, and then I got a call from the the Kentucky Housing Corporation asking me to come back and oversee or support this new initiative, these 10, 10, 10 100 bed recovery centers that were going to be uh, built in Kentucky over the next three to five years. So I did come back, uh, and I've been working with the Kentucky Housing Corporation for about 19 years now, um, working with these uh, what we now have 13 programs plus the model programs of Louisville and Lexington. So we actually have 17 hundred bed programs. Uh, we built um, we built um, six, I'm sorry, um, uh, five. At first, we built five programs for women and five for men across the state. So I'm going to talk about then why did we do this? The initiative was to help Kentuckians recover from substance abuse in rural and urban communities across the Commonwealth. Studies indicate that substance addiction is one of the leading causes of homelessness in Kentucky. Who will be served in these programs? Well, 
we're focusing on the homeless. That's why the Kentucky Housing Corporation is involved. We're looking at persons at risk for homelessness. And we're looking at referrals from the judicial system. Also with persons, any person with a substance use disorder. So we looked at the geographic areas. We wanted the, the programs to be geographically centered across the state. Um, this next slide will show you the first 10 programs. You can see it's pretty equally distributed across the state. Five programs are for women, five programs are for men. These are 100 bed programs. Outside of the Louisville and Lexington area, uh, these are all rural areas. Um, we were not sure whether this, this model would work. We knew it worked in an urban area, but where you had a lot of resources, but we weren't sure if it was gonna work in the, in the rural areas. But we pleasantly have found that it does work. The model works wherever you, wherever you are. We would prefer the model to be in a, in a community where these men and women are interacting with people in the community. And in most of our programs, that's the, that's the vision and that's the pro prototype that we developed that we want to be part of the community, not separated from the community. We want, to be, we want to be in the community in order to help kind of give back what we've been so freely given in this program. So the facility model serves, as I mentioned, 100 individuals. It encompasses space for three different components. We have a safe off the streets. We call it uh, SOS. Um, and there's usually about 15 beds in this SOS. I'll show you a picture in a minute of those uh, beds. It's a dormitory setting. Then we have another room in the building that's uh, 15 beds, which is we call it the motivational track. And that's the track where the men and women are in. It's again, a dormitory setting where they're making the decision as to whether they really want to change their lifestyle to, to start a, a program of long-term recovery. Then we have in each program, in some programs, the first 10 programs we built, we had 38 double occupancy apartments. So the, the men or the women, once they've completed the, the SOS, which is about a week, they go into the motivational track, which is about four to six weeks. Then they get into an apartment. So they have either a single apartment in some, some programs or, or a double occupancy apartment. Again, I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. This gives you an idea of the, this beautiful facility. This is our Recovery Kentucky program in Owensboro, Kentucky. This is one in Harlan County in uh, Everett, Kentucky. You can see the mountains behind us. This is in Campbellsville, Kentucky for men. They're all similar prototypes in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, um, structure of the facility. This is the George Privet Center for Men in Lexington. This is in Paducah, Kentucky. That's the receptionist office as you come into the facility to give you an idea of what it, they're beautiful facilities. This is the living room of the Owensboro Men's Program. Uh, they're beautifully, and this program was built about 10 years ago. If you walked in today, you, it would look just as, as, as beautiful. It's, they, they keep it immaculate. They, there's, they take such pride in these, in these programs. All the programs have a full kitchen, an industrial style kitchen. This is the Owensboro kitchen. This is the dining room of the Harlan program for women, the Cumberland Hope for women. I mentioned the dormitories. This is the Paducah dormitory. The, this is the, like a, it's kind of a non-medical detox, although we do have some people that come into the program that are that are uh, going through withdrawal. Many of the people have uh, already gone through withdrawal, but we have some that are still in the process of withdrawing from drugs or alcohol. But they're in this dormitory setting for about five days uh, until they get uh, through the, the detox process and get oriented to the program. I mentioned the motivational track. Um, these are women from the Hopkinsville program that are on a cold rainy day. Uh, as part of the motivational track, they take off about every morning about eight o'clock or 8.30. They walk about two miles to a location in the community where they go through classes uh, on recovery dynamics. And this is a group of the women that are taking off for a, about a mile, mile and a half walk to that education center. We do this, we call it trudging for sobriety. We, we, we think this is important. It helps to bond the, the women and the men 
Um, and it's a good good form of exercise. And we do make accommodations for those those persons that can't uh, can't trudge or can't walk. Uh, we we can accommodate that. Again, this is a, a two bedroom program um, in in Harlan. You can see that they're beautifully accommodated. And then we 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 don't want an institutional model. We want a home like model. So almost all of our programs have a have a dog, a pet in the facility, and uh, the men and women really care for that. It's, it certainly adds to the uh, ambiance in the in the facility to have a have a pet. So this is the Recovery Kentucky model. It's a program. I want to get into a little bit of the the, the type of program it is. Um, and I, uh, I I know that most of the people that are listening to this are are physicians or in the medical field. This is not a clinical program. This is not a medical program. This is a social model program. So take off your clinical hat and welcome to the, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the, the, the format for the, the, the model that we're uh, embracing and helping the men and women recover from addiction. We use a, uh, a curriculum called Recovery Dynamics. This is a uh, uh, curriculum that was actually designed and written by a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Joe McQueenie. Um, from Little Rock, Arkansas, with the uh, 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 I'm blanking on the name, the, the uh, Kelly Foundation. The residents live in this recovery center for up to 24 months, although most of them only stay six to nine months. The majority of them leave after about six to nine months. Some stay on as peer mentors that are teaching the classes uh, and going through the program to, to help other men and women recover from the from the from alcoholism and drug addiction. So the program is based on a mutual help system of the 12 step program, an education a recovery curriculum. We focus on personal accountability. Community accountability, giving back to the community. Um, that's part of our uh, our. Uh, approach in the community is to help uh, help that community who's who've been so supportive of us, uh, and then to workforce development. All of the individuals we we want to get them ready for work if they're if they're capable of working uh, to get get back into the workforce, and then we focus on positive behavior change. So the phases of the recovery program I mentioned earlier something called safe off the streets, the motivational tracks that's that that period where they're trudging to classes and working on the first three steps of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Then we have phase one. That's where the, the individuals are focusing on the, the steps uh, four through 12 of the 12 steps. And they're really, that's where the real heart of the program is, is that is that phase one recovery program. Phase two is those men or women that are Become, become peer mentors, they, they, they continue to stay in the program, and then they begin teaching classes and mentoring those coming behind them. That's a, a very, very powerful part of this program is that mentoring that goes on. Those men and women that have been on the streets, that have been drinking and drug using drugs, oftentimes with those people that are now coming into the program. And so you'll see someone who's, who's in the program in the SOS phase of the program and they're now being mentored by somebody that they were using. Uh, and it's a very, very powerful experience. Then finally, transition back to the community. We look at community partnerships. We look for health departments for support, hospitals and community health clinics, mental health centers for support, uh, workforce force development, and employers that are interested in hiring our individuals that, that leave the program. We look at community volunteers, and then we have recovery and community engagement. The program is peer driven, but is supervised by professional staff. Um, the crux of this program is that peer driven approach to helping men and women recover from addiction. That is, that is a extremely powerful tool. We don't do group therapy. We don't do individual therapy. We do mentoring, education, and modeling the behavior that we want those individuals to um, adhere to. 
So it's education and mutual help programs help residents focus on the internal change, changes and attitudes, their errors in thinking, and ultimately the behavioral change that supports a drug-free life. We use the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is based on the program of staff. The staff is the basis of the authority, which is experiential. The participation in the program is not coerced. Uh, the peer mentors and program participants help run the program with professional staff support. Uh, the physical environment is home-like and not institutional. Um, we guide the, the critical elements of this program. We guide people through the 12 steps of AA. Um, we teach the recovery dynamics curriculum. Uh, it is a hybrid peer-run therapeutic community. We role model the social changes that need to be need to be made in the in the program. We have accountability for each other for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the men and women in this program are, we have 100 men or 100 women in the program. So it, the program is really dependent upon the men and the women that are holding each other accountable. Um, they're mentoring, but they're also um, asking the, the individuals to be accountable for their behaviors. Um, and every we have a what we call a community meeting three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, about an hour a day when the, those men and women that are in phase one will hold themselves accountable and they'll s provide suggestions for improvement of their life uh, in that community. Um, and it's a very powerful uh, community setting. Um, the The staff do not participate. they 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 attend, but they do not participate in the community meeting. We believe that the, the peers, the, the, the men and women that are mentoring each other need to give the best feedback to them as far as behavior changes, which will help them in the long run to recover from their addiction. We keep the focus on recovery first. Many times people come into these programs with many, many problems. Now, we, we, not that we, 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 we are attentive to mental health issues and physical health issues, but we focus primarily on the recovery from addiction. We don't want the person to be sidetracked with other issues while they're in this program. We, those other issues, if they can wait, now some, some can't wait. We have someone who's been abused sexually or someone who's a victim of domestic violence, that oftentimes has to be addressed at the same time you're in the recovery program. But for other issues, we want a solid basis of recovery before we uh, move on to other issues. We help the person own their disease. Many people who come into this program, they don't understand they have a disease. They, it's, they think that they just are, are bad people. They're just, uh, they, they, they don't realize that this is a disease process that's taken place in their bodies. And once they understand that there is a solution to this, it's not a curable. We don't see, say we can cure this disease, but there is a solution to this. And we find that through the 12 steps of the program. Uh, it's a program of empowerment and self-determination. It's a program of attraction. Uh, and again, as I said, self-governance and peer teaching and working with others. So we have um, the men and women share their experience, strength, and hope. And that's part of this process of recovery is sharing what, uh, what you've been given by someone that's been in the program before you. We do have a zero tolerance uh, for drug or alcohol use. Uh, if the person uses drugs or alcohol while in the program, they'll have to be removed from the housing part. In some cases, they could go back to start the program over. Most of the time when someone does use, they're, they're wanting to leave. They're, they're not ready to enter the program. So they, they basically leave and go back to their community. We will not tolerate any violence or threats of violence. That would be immediate discharge. Any racism would be um, cause for immediate discharge, any sexual acting out, and any stealing. Those are all what we call cardinal rules for um, uh, leaving the program. So again, the critical elements are meeting people where they are, loving people back to life. Um, we use the term, I'm my brother's keeper. Um, we use the term unconditional love of the individual, our focus is to confront the behavior, not the not the individual, um, and um, so that that kind of sums up the 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 program, uh, the model. Um, the Recovery Kentucky program helps residents identify the problem, 
the solution to the problem and the action steps uh, that are needed. And clients learn a lifetime solution to their problems. So I'm going to stop with that and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. TK Logan. And uh, she's going to talk about the research. We're, we're so we're proud of the research that's, that's gone into this program. Uh, we've been researching this for now, I think, 12 years. We're going on our 12th, 11th or 12th year. So Dr. Logan's going to give an overview of the research findings that has come about as a result of this program. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for being here to hear about this program. So I'm just going to really give a quick overview of the um, evaluation that we do, um, quickly talk about the methods and the limitations, and then give a preview of the outcomes. And then, of course, always it's important to understand sort of the satisfaction or what clients think about the program themselves. So I do want to say, like, I do tend to talk fast and, and, and I'm going to keep this pretty short, but there are two peer reviewed publications. I will show those at the end. Also, we have two years worth of reports and quick fact sheets that kind of summarize the results of the evaluation that are posted on our website. And I'll show you where that is as well. So you can access any of that later. Just a quick, and this is for the most recent year that's out on our website. Um, we had about 1,548 intakes or baselines um, and 283 follow-ups. What we do is we randomly select a sample that are stratified by target months. So it's 12 months after intake is what, about when we do the follow-up, but we want to, we stratify that by month. So if a client did their intake in June, then that's when we're going to try to target their follow-up. Um, and then um, we ask at the intake about the six months and 30 days before they entered the program. And at follow-up, we ask about the six months and 30 days before the follow-up. So just quickly, the limitations. So as um, Mike sort of talked about, there's a couple of phases before we get to phase one, but the research opportunity is presented to um, participants at phase one of the program. And it's voluntary because it's research, so it's voluntary. Uh, also, I do have to say that it's also a burden on staff, always research. It's a it's a, a financial burden on programs, which is part of the reason we have the two, we cap our follow ups at 280 uh, or around there um, is because of those financial constraints. And also. Um, it's time burden. So the staff at the program collect the intakes or work with the participant to get those intakes done. We don't have a comparison group. Our follow-ups, that's what I just talked about there. Um, it's about 12 months after intake, which this for this year that I'm going to show you, and it does change a little bit over time, but for this year, uh, there's only about an average of 4.4 months sort of out of the program. So obviously there are people who were out sooner, there are people who took longer, so it's just that average. However, there's research showing that relapse is most likely to occur within about three months of leaving the program. And also our uh, results are self-report. So there are people that want to see other kinds of outcomes, um, and those are very costly uh, in terms of time and, and money to get those. So ours are self-report, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we get our follow-ups. The great thing about this program is because the Recovery Kentucky programs are, they, they want this data. They're all about this information, so we have good longitudinal trends over time and we can we know who it, it is a unique sample these are just as you can see i'll present some trends over time and these are sort of the intakes and the follow-ups you can see that intakes have come down a little bit and that's that that's some covid period there as well and just to give you some idea of the financial <laughs> constraints or the amount of effort it takes. So like I mentioned, we pull a random sample of people to follow up and then target each month. So it's kind of spread out through that 12 months. 
Um, in 2014, before all our robocalls hit us, you can see that it, you know, we made almost 3,000 calls to get our 280. But by 2020, um, it's uh, for 4,500 calls. The mailings have gone up. So it just takes an incredible amount of effort because it's important to me as we do these follow ups that we don't just talk to the people that are easiest to get a hold of. We want to talk to those who are easy to get a hold of, but those who are very difficult to get a hold of, too. So that's part of the reason for this extra effort. One of the things we do do, of course, is always look at those who weren't followed up, their characteristics on the intake and those who were. And for this year, we don't have any differences. That changes a little bit. Usually we don't have a lot of differences, but so just a quick look at who does the program serve. So this is just looking at the intakes for this fiscal year, the most recent fiscal year. Um, it's more male than female. Uh, the average age is about 36 years old, but it ranges from 19 to 72. It is mostly white. Um, and again, this is a statewide perspective. So Lexington and Louisville may have a little bit different distribution, but our state as a, in, a, in general is this isn't far off from the overall distribution, uh, race, ethnicity. And 22% of the sample did not have a high school diploma or a GED. So you can see the educational distribution there. Just looking at substance use, um, alcohol is always in, in all of our follow-up studies of substance use disorder programs in Kentucky, it's lower than drug use. Um, smoking is very high and we're seeing vape come up a little more among these populations over time as well. This is just a trend. This is what's neat about this data that we have is we can look at these trends over time. So you can see that the prescription opioids of people entering who use six months before entering that program, it's gone down a little bit over time. Um, that's the bu buprenorphine um, off the street, so not the prescription. The methadone, um, let's see, I'm sorry, that's bup. The brown is methamphetamine. So you can see that's come up a little bit over time. And, well, this is a little harder to see. No, that's that last one here. Okay, so 56% this at this year used methamphetamine, 41% were using prescription opioids, 33%, that's the heroin, and then the buprenorphine and um, methadone has really gone down over time without a prescription. Of course, mental health um, symptoms as they come into the program are very important to consider including the depression, generalized anxiety, you can see suicidality and PTSD are pretty high. All of our measures are outlined in our reports as well. Um, looking at criminal justice involvement, you can see over half had been arrested in that six months before entering the program. Um, almost 78% had been incarcerated at least for some period of time during that six months before, and 78% are under criminal justice system supervision. And just over one third um, report they are homeless before they came in or had a period of homelessness before coming into the program. When we look at the follow-up, our follow-up sample, about 82% reported completing phase one. And they were in the program about an average of 7.6 months. So this is just looking at the characteristics of those that we followed up. So it's a little more equal, a little more female than male here. So we definitely stratify by gender to try to get a, a, distri a better distribution of that. Um, they were 35 years old on average. So looking at um, any illicit um, drug use six months before entering the program to six months before the follow-up, you can see there's quite a decline there. And when we look at those trends over time, across state, across programs, they are pretty uh, stable over time, both at intake and at follow-up. This is alcohol use. So about 41% said they had used any alcohol um, before coming, the six months before coming into the program. And 8% basically said they had used any alcohol in the six months before the follow-up. 
these are the trends over time. And you can see that the alcohol use has actually decreased over time at intake and at follow-up have remained fairly stable. We look at other uh, mental health symptoms. We see significant declines across depression, generalized anxiety, and then we often look at the comorbid depression and anxiety, suicidal thoughts or attempts significantly reduced from pre to post. Involvement in the criminal justice system has gone down over time. And these are just trends in any incarceration. You can see, again, they're pretty stable over time, both at intake and follow-up here. Homelessness is definitely declines. And these are just some of the trends in homelessness as well. Employment goes up quite a bit, um, and this is employed at least one month in that six-month period before either coming into the program or before the follow-up. Certainly, the mutual um, help meetings goes up um, in terms of how many uh, people are attending those meetings in the 30 days before the intake versus the 30 days before the follow-up. Quality of life is an interesting measure. It's just a one question, but it has shown to be um, to include factors that you don't necessarily measure, especially when you're talking about an evaluation of a program where you can't ask all the questions in the world. So this is just a nice global um, quality of life measure, global measure of what matters to each client. And you can see at intake, the average is 3.9 out of a 10 point scale, but at follow up, it's 8.6. So we see a significant increase there. And again, if we look at trends over time, we see a pretty stable um, both at intake and follow up. And then, as everyone here knows, recovery is bigger than just a uh, return to use or relapse. So one of the things that we've started doing in the last few years with the data is kind of looking at sort of overall functioning. Um, and what we call this multidimensional recovery status. So we take into consideration the SUD according SUD according to the DSM disorder, employment at least part time, not being homeless, um, not being in, back involved, reinvolved with the um, criminal justice system, uh, consideration of suicide ideation, uh, overall health. Um, having at least one person they can count on for recovery support and having that mid to high level quality of life. So when we do that, we see a significant difference from intake to follow up where uh, about two thirds of people are had all of those recovery, positive recovery dimensions. So about one third are still struggling, at least in some of those areas. And you can see that that also stays pretty stable over time. When we ask clients how well the program worked for them, overall, the recovery center programs usually get very positive ratings. Um, you can see here 69% rated as high as you can get, 21% pretty well, only 6% somewhat, and 4% not of all. 88.7% said they would refer a friend to the program, which is another way of kind of getting at um, satisfaction. We also break this down, and there's more detail in the reports, but sort of each of the dimensions of what they liked about the program. Um, for example, they felt heard. They got to work on things that were that mattered to them. They felt like it was a good method, a, a fit for them. They had connections with the staff there. They had input into their recovery and their treatment while in the program, they felt cared about, they felt like people believed in them and that their expectations and hopes for recovery for, were met. So very high ratings across all of those dimensions. And just quickly, here are the two peer-reviewed publications where you can learn more about the outcomes as well as that website at the bottom. Um, if you go to that um, cdar.uky.edu and hit our cost, you can see there's a, a number of different things out there to look at. 
I'm going to stop sharing and put you back on. Just introduce Tom. Okay, I would I would like now to uh, introduce you to two individuals that um, have been um, recipients of the Recovery Kentucky program that are now working uh, in the field. And I want to say I'm going to start with Tony White. Tony is the uh, uh, he's working now with the Fletcher Group. And and I, I failed to mention, but I want to say now the Fletcher Group. One of the things that's happened as a result of the success of this Recovery Kentucky model is Governor Fletcher has implemented a plan to try to replicate this program across the country. So we've got a lot of interest in other states. I believe Tony can talk to, to that, but uh, I think Wisconsin, uh, Montana, there's been many states that have got an interest. It's already been replicated in North Carolina, in West Virginia. I think West Virginia has six or seven recovery model programs that are have been replicated um, from this model. Um, so it's been, been quite successful. It's a low cost alternative to the to the medical model of care. As I mentioned, this is a social model of care. But Tony's going to talk a little bit about his experiences uh, as both a recipient and now as and 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 then later as a as a director of two of the Recovery Kentucky programs. Tony. Thank you, Mike. I just want to say thank you to everyone for your time and your attention. It really is a privilege to be here with with everyone today. Again, my name is Tony White, and I'm a person committed to long-term recovery since July of 2003. And uh, what my recovery has basically returned me back to my family and uh, has given me a life beyond my uh, wildest dreams. Um, almost 20 years ago, uh, this opportunity was nowhere in my universe of thought. And so uh, he's just very grateful to have this opportunity. And um, as Mike mentioned, um, my current uh, position as a director of outreach with the Fletcher Group. In uh, 2017, the Fletcher Group received a HRSA grant to create a rural center of excellence of recovery housing. And um, you know, our, our mission in conjunction with offering this model to other states is to increase the quantity and quality of reco recovery housing in rural communities. And uh, again, as Mike mentioned too, that, uh, and I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but um, have had the privilege of uh, being on the transition team to help for, to help open the first men's recovery Kentucky center that's located in uh, Moorhead, Kentucky. And, uh, and that would have been about October of 2007. And the community mental health provider that was a facilitator of that process was awarded another recovery Kentucky sanity center. And I believe around 2014 and uh, it was a half hour further east from Moorhead in Grayson, Kentucky, um, and went out there to help open that one too. And so uh, it was program director there until April of uh, 2020. And I had the opportunity to come on with the Fletcher Group. And um, the yeah, there was a, a varying degrees of services and technical support and a, a just a vast wealth and depth of you know subject matter experts with, within the Fletcher Group, and um, I'll try and make sure that I put the uh, our website in the chat. But um, yeah, the, the the short of it is, I guess in two thousand and two, my mother, um, I was in Atlanta, Georgia. I had had a home, I had been in recovery, but um, I had uh, had a recurrence, had a relapse. And uh, four months, the water had been off in my house, the electricity had been off. And on January 1st, uh, 2002, my mother came out of her bedroom and she looked at her son sitting on her couch, eating her food, watching her television set and said, you need to do something. And um, I, I, made, I made a phone call to someone and, um, he asked me a question. He said, you know, or do you have any money? And of course the answer was no. Asked if I had insurance. I was like, no. And um, what is, would there be any willing, anyone willing to pay for treatment for me? And I just said, probably not. And he said, well, there's a, uh, 
a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky that has a recovery program. It's probably not what you're used to. It's called the Healing Place. He said, give them a call and they, and, uh, and they give me a call back. And I called and um, the gentleman that picked up the phone, I uh, told him I said I needed some help and um, immediately said that there was a bed available. But uh, yeah, I said I was in Atlanta and said, well, we'll after some questions, some answers, he uh, yeah, said, well, when you can, when you get, get away here, um, we'll, we'll make sure that you can get in. And, um, you know, as I said before that, my, um, well, my, my date from uh, the last substance is July, July 03. And so probably, I think, I believe it was, uh, February or excuse me, January 11th. It was, a when, um, my mother had gotten me that one way plane ticket to, to get to Louisville and, um, and a gentleman from the, uh, the healing place, uh, well, they called it detox, a staff member picked me up at the airport and, um, without going into the whole thing, um, I, I, all I can say is that I was willing to, to ask for help, unwilling to, um, to really take full responsibility, um, for having, um, a substance use disorder or being an alcoholic or an addict. And um, very unique, different, um, and, uh, and 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 very, very and with a very strong will. And um, while I was there, uh, I saw in one of the uh, the questions in the chat, uh, like that we we carried this tradition along um, with all the recovery Kentucky centers. But yeah, I had two recurrences while I was at the healing place, two relapses. But both times I was offered, well, well, the first one I was offered, um, I was in phase two in the transition portion, and they offered me services back in the, in the non-medical detox and the SOS. And, um, and let me, you know, go back through the program again. Um, that time I had moved after that, and I guess it would have been, oh, golly, January, January, um, May of 2003 had moved into an efficiency apartment. And, um, and again, um, I just wasn't willing to, to follow the, the outline of the program and the suggestions of the program. And uh, some of my support group hadn't heard from me for a minute. And the gentleman who at that time was the phase two coordinator and his assistant came by my apartment. And, um, you know, I, I won't go into the whole conversation, but I asked them if I could come back and they said, absolutely, yes. And, um, you know, that last time, um, all I can say is that I had, had other brothers and sisters who had entered the program and that they were back with their families. They were um, gainfully employed, <clears throat> you know, or they were in their own independent living. And it just seemed like I was just watching life just pass me by. and you know, something kind of clicked inside and said, you know, if those, if those guys can do it, then I can too. And, um, you know, some suggestions were made. I, I took those suggestions and, uh, you know, after, um, because I'd been through the program before, um, I was a granted, I, I would say a little extra, um, let's see, I became very willing just to follow the guidelines and, and get, and get with the program. And, and so it was about three and a half months later, um, it was granted the privilege of being become a peer mentor to do small C case management, to teach a recovery dynamics, to be a role model, um, to try and role model the recovery principles and role model and, and, and be a, a walking demonstration of what recovery looks like. Uh, but I also have to say that um, I was, there are two kinds of teachers in the world. There's folks who teach us what to do and folks who teach us what not to do. And I, I did both, and um, and that's where the uh, the beauty of the accountability, where my brothers would um, simply ask if what I had said or what I was thinking was appropriate or inappropriate, and um, growing in willingness to take personal responsibility and be accountable, but also to um, growing and courage to ask others if what they had said or done was appropriate or inappropriate. 
and then working together as a community, whether it be in a community meeting or a group of us together. Um, you know, they helped me wrap the recovery principles that are laid out in the 12 steps around that particular situation um, and that, so that could lay that groundwork and that, found, that foundation to move towards being um, independent um, through a relationship with, well, I will just describe as a, that is larger than me and begin to be able to follow and um, I just, just become a more um, hope productive, definitely more productive and caring individual. Um, I was in the paramedic office for almost a year. That last month, um, I had transitioned to a 47 bed recovery house called the Beacon House and became, I was on staff there. Um, I was there and worked my way up to become manager of that house, all of it with the facilitation of the peer led, peer driven social model. And um, again, as I mentioned before, in 2007, um, was hired by a community health provider that was the facilitator of the first men's center in Moorhead to be operations manager. Um, and then uh, a year later became program director. And as I stated before, um, had the privilege of being program direct director of two of these programs. And, you know, I can't, uh, I can't say, I can't say enough, um, the privilege of, uh, you know, the change that has taken place, the, the chance, uh, the opportunities that have been given as a result of recovery, but also the privilege of, I, I like to describe that position as my job was to, to hold the door open so that others could come in and find their way um, to recovery and lives of purpose and connectivity and reunification and, um, and moving away from um, and just being through the recovery, being able to be a, to have a possible, the option and the, the privilege of no longer um, being involved in the criminal justice system. So, um, Mike, that's right. It, I timed myself that's 10 minutes and 45 seconds, but I, I just want to stop there. I just want to thank everyone for your time and your attention. And, um, and I'll just turn it back over to Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. Uh, you've been a real asset to to all of us in Kentucky to help uh, model what uh, what we're trying to uh, accomplish in, in this program. You know the the uh, the twelve steps uh, of the of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is goes like this: Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. And that's really the epitome of what this, what men and women who have recovered from addiction are doing in, the, in this model is giving back what they've been so freely given. And people like Tony and Nicole uh, are, are living that 12th step of, of recovery uh, by offering their experiences, their strength and their hope to others. So with that, I wanna introduce Nicole Friels. Nicole is also the, uh, a product of one of our recovery programs, uh, the, the Hope Center in, in Lexington. And she went on to be the director of the Warm Center um, in uh, in Henderson, Kentucky. And is now the, I believe you're, are you vice president of the program of the operations at this time? Or have you- A chief operating chief officer. Chief operating officer of the, mm. of the uh, women's and, and men's program. They operate actually two programs, but one in Henderson and, uh, Bowling Green. So, Nicole, it's yours. Um, well, my name is Nicole Frields. Um, I was at the Women's Hope Center um, from 2006 to 2007. Um, on June the 4th of this year, I will celebrate 17 years of sobriety. Um, I was involved with meth at a very young age. Um, High school, I was still able to maintain um, and still, you know, participate in um, cheerleading and things like that. Um, graduated with a good GPA. Um, I went to college right after um, graduation, and that's whenever I really started to go downhill um, without, you know, parents um, 
staying on my case to do the things that I needed to do. Um, I could not hold a job. Um, I could not tell the truth. Um, after I was charged with a felony at age 21, um, ended up getting a five-year sentence, and then I was incarcerated. While I was incarcerated, um, I had someone advocate on my behalf um, in order for me to be sent to the Hope Center. And I did have previous attempts um, at treatment where I tried to get sober and failed. Um, when I was 22, I was sent to Hazelden in Minnesota. I completed the program there. My family spent boatloads of money paying for that. Um, and it did plant the seed, but it wasn't what I needed for to establish long-term sobriety. Um, I had a baby um, in 2004 and I did not use drugs during my pregnancy. However, um, about when he was about a week old, I picked up again. And, you know, the saying that it always gets worse, it never, you know, goes back to where your addiction is manageable. That was an understatement. But I was on probation during that time. I did fail a couple of drug screens. Um, <clears throat> so I got to the Hope Center and I was like, holy moly, where am I at? <laughs> um, I, th the facility that I went to only had about 60 clients, but I still thought that that was, you know, a lot of people to be around all the time. And I honestly thought they were brainwashed at first. Um, after I got into the program and saw how it worked, and I was assigned a peer mentor to follow me, <clears throat> like help me with homework, um, teach me things, be a mentor to me. And I asked her one day, like, why are you smiling all the time? And she said it was because she loved to be sober and then listed, you know, several other reasons. And this person was someone that I wanted to emulate. I would see her parents uh, and bring her kids and then they would pick her up on the weekends when she would be allowed to go on passes. And I just knew that I wanted to get back to my son. He was 16 months old. And I felt like I was missing out on so much and that I had been a failure to him up until that point. Um, I think that's where I found the willingness to actually work a program and continue to do that. Um, the Hope Center taught me how to be responsible. It taught me how to keep a job. It kept me how it taught me how to keep my word, tell the truth. Um, I was a very entitled, selfish human because I had been spoiled growing up. Um, it taught me how to show up and be there for other people. Um, I think it is it, it just instilled in me this desire to help others. Um, I left the Hope Center um, after, I think, nine months. I also was a peer mentor. Um, during that transition period, um, I knew that the warm center was being built in my hometown and I sent in a resume, I got an interview, um, and I was hired for the front desk position. So while I was at the front desk, uh, position, um, I continued to get promotions. Um, I managed the phase two part of the program for a while. Um, and then maybe a year later, I was promoted to program director. Um, and I basically ran the program for, you know, decided what was going to be taught, who we were going to hire, things like that. And then fast forward, I was uh, promoted to, um, I've had several different titles, but right now I'm chief operating officer. And I am next in line to be CEO of 
uh, two 100 bed treatment facilities, 64 sober living units, a transition house, uh, a, a resource um, center where people can just walk in off the street and say, hey, I need help with whatever they need help with, and we will connect them um, to the appropriate services. Um, you know, I'm a homeowner. Uh, my, my children have never seen me under the influence. Um, I, my son probably did, but he was too young to remember. I've been able to raise them on my own. They have an absent father. Um, I have um, studied at Western Kentucky University. Um, I received a bachelor's degree. Um, I took the test to become a certified drug and alcohol counselor. Um, I have an MBA. Um, right now, I'm about a year away from graduating um, with the master's in social work. Um, but all of these things would not have been possible if I had not had the peer-driven program of recovery. Um, I think that aspect is what really makes it stick because what happens is people have issues with authority and, you know, things like that. Um, but this allows your peers to correct your behavior and give you suggestions. And even if you aren't the one being addressed, you learn from watching others' mistakes and the feedback that they get. Um, and I think the most special thing about Recovery Kentucky is that, you know, we, there's, I, I can't remember how many um, centers that Mike said that we have now, but we are all networked together. We all communicate. Um, if we can't provide a service for a client and feel they could be better served, served elsewhere, all we have to do is pick up the phone and say, hey, can you help me out with this person? Yeah, sure. It, it, problem solved. Um, it, it's truly an honor um, to have been asked to speak today about Recovery Kentucky. I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole and Tony, um, that you guys are amazing. And uh, I just want you to know that some of the participants have expressed their gratitude for you all to be on to talk about. And you really remind me how much courage it takes to to reach out and to, to seek help, but also the strength and the persistence that you all had to overcome and achieve everything you've achieved. Um, we're going to go to the questions now. Um, so the first one is recovery means many things to many people. Some, some use may occur even when someone is going through recovery. Is disqualifying those who slip a good practice? Sorry. Yeah, recovery in, in, in my way of looking at it is a lifetime issue. We do know that that individuals do relapse. I think probably you heard from Tony and, and Nicole, they, they they probably didn't get sober the first time. Uh, they had multiple opportunities. Um, they learned from each experience. So the fact that a person relapses doesn't mean not in any way mean that they're a failure. They've learned that, you know, they, they, their attempts to control the behavior is simply not there. They're they're not going to be able to control alcohol and drug use. Uh, they've lost that ability. So, uh, but slips are part of the process. And uh, while we don't look forward to a to a uh, slip, we we do honor people that, that make it make an attempt to come back. And one of the things that our recovery Kentucky programs offer is if you complete the program, if you complete the uh, phase one of the program and you leave the program and you relapse at any time in the rest of your life, you always have a bid. You will get the next available bid. You are family to this program. So we we honor you because you've made that attempt to, to work through the program and you will always have a bid available for you. And, um, you know, this this is not a question, but I do just want to say, Nicole, I, I thought you brought up a really um, important point, and that's the social aspect and the the issue with authority or autonomy, the, how important it is 
to have your own autonomy. And there's a, a new report out from the Surgeon General, I believe, on loneliness right now. So I just think how this program kind of surrounds people um, with support, social support is, is huge. Moving on to the next question, um, how are medications like buprenorphine, a camprostate, I don't know, and nal naltrexone used to assist in recovery? Yeah, we're, we're going through a transition phase right now. Uh, our programs at first, when we first opened, we were not accepting people on, uh, on Suboxone or Methadone. Um, we've now modified our, our program so that we are going to begin uh, accepting individuals on Suboxone. Uh, uh, we've not, I doubt that we'll have many on, on Methadone, but Suboxone it seems to be more prevalent uh, the Americans with Disability Act has come on and said you've got you cannot uh, not uh, allow a person to uh, enter a program if they're on a prescribed medication that's approved by FDA. Uh, so we are going to be accepting, or we are accepting people uh, on Suboxone in our program. So that's a nice segue to the next question. And Nicole, did you want to add to oh, that? Sorry. Yeah, I think another reason that we wanted to incorporate medication assisted treatment um, was because fentanyl has completely changed the recovery landscape. And what we were seeing was we would have these people come in that were addicted to fentanyl, which is obviously the most powerful opioid out there right now. And they would come in, they would be very, very sick from the withdrawal and they would stay a couple of days and then they would leave. Um, so we wanted to be able to accommodate people um, with medication-assisted treatment to keep them here and keep them alive. And, and that's basically it. So the next question is, how do you reconcile the abstinence model of AA with those individuals who are receiving medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders? and by definition may never be abstinent? Well, that's a philosophical question that uh, I mean, it, we, we struggle with that. Uh, we think that this is, there are many, many approaches to treatment for, for addiction. Uh, our program, we focus on an abstinence-based model. However, we're incorporating uh, MAT into our program now, but our program is not for everyone. If, if a person simply wants another approach to recovery, we welcome them to it. We will refer them to any program that will help them. We, we do not think that we're the, the end of all. Um, we think we can help many, many people if they're willing to uh, try the program and invest themselves. It's, this is a tough program. This is a very difficult program to achieve sobriety using the 12 steps. It takes a lot of internal uh, fortitude of, of look, looking at your uh, inner self. Um, and uh, some people don't want to do that. Some people don't want, they want an easier way. But it, it, anyway, if it, as long as it is, it results in, in um, sobriety or uh, abstinence or ma uh, maintenance, if that works for you, we're, we're, we welcome that. So switching um, topics a little bit, someone is asking, um, do you have a relationship with community agencies and businesses to help your um, clients get jobs? I'm going to let Nicole answer that one. I think she can, you can speak for all the programs, Nicole. Absolutely. Um, whenever we first opened, we just went around and met with local business owners. Hey, we have these women that are coming out of the program. Um, they've been with us um, in the beginning. They used to stay for a year, um, <clears throat> but they've been in a very structured um, environment. They work hard um, and, and they're well versed because they do all of the jobs around the facility for us and they rotate. So they've had experience doing that. But at, at first we were sending them to factories for the most part, but now I mean, we have women that work for, you know, other recovery programs. We have women that work for doctors, lawyers. Um, we have we have business owners. We have people that have started their own businesses. Um, in Bowling Green, um, for our men's program, we met with um, 
a business owner that owns just tons of tons of businesses in that area. And we said, hey, give us a chance. And now we have six Mark alumni that are actually um, superintendents on construction sites. Hmm. And we actually have people that call us and say, hey, do you have any clients that are looking for a job because they do such good jobs? Okay. Do you? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Logan. Yeah, if I could just add to that real quick. One of the, you know, in the in the data, talk about how many residents, men and women, come into the programs who don't have a GED, and you know, all the centers how they've either um, brought gotten relationships, and it's that we, you know, we in Moorhead and Grayson, and I know the other centers too have established either with a community college or with an adult learning center. So that those, those institutions would come in and provide the GED services to the men and women who don't have them. And Nicole, I'd, I'd, I'd have to say uh, probably, I'll, I'll lowball it and say maybe 92% of the folks who came in that didn't have one before transitioning out have, have received their GED and, and also uh, have been just through their own um, desire to you know, continue their education, whether it be a technical college or to enroll in college itself and, 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 and to continue on. Thank you. That is a great point, a really good connection for that education and that continued skills training, like um, to not just get employment, but to get better employment. <laughs> um, did you look if any of your clients used to serve in the military? So we definitely do have that data um, I don't know if you all want to speak to that as well. Um, I don't. We don't have many in it's, from it's the military. Small. It's it's a small number, but we do we do keep track of that. But yes, we do have a few. Okay, so the next um, question. So for clients with OUD, what is the rate of relapse and overdose after completing the program? Medications for OUD saves lives. Do people get naloxone at completion of the program or if they have to leave for using drugs? There's a higher risk of overdose and fatal overdose after periods of sobriety. So the data shows very little return to use of any kind of drug. That's all in our reports. We break it down by specific kind of drugs as well as overall. So it's just, it's very small. I don't know about the naloxone. Yeah. Yeah, I think all of our programs have naloxone in the facilities. We keep that uh, as a, an emergency case for anyone who might overdose while they're in the facility. Um, I don't I don't think any of the programs is handed out to residents as they leave. Uh, most of the times if you leave, they, you, you leave um, in the middle of the night or you, you, you don't you don't ask permission. You just go, you just take off. But uh, that's, I don't think it's a practice that we've been implemented to um, issue uh, naloxone to people that graduate from the program. I guess our, our, our optimism is that people are not going to need that. I know the reality is that relapse is part of the, part of the problem, that, uh, and it, it's going to ultimately happen in many cases. But we've not, I don't think our programs are issuing it uh, when people leave the program. Tony or Nicole, do you, can you either I keep, confirm? I keep it stocked. And I'll give it to anyone that asks for it, but okay. just automatically giving it to them when they, upon discharge, we don't do that. Yeah, yeah. I just I will just add to you that the, the Faces and Voices affiliate here in Kentucky is called People Advocating Recovery, and there are many uh, recovery-oriented organizations and RCOs that do regular trainings on how to administer the naloxone, um, and it is. It, really accessible here in Kentucky for it's, it's now over the counter, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, PAR has done trainings at many of the centers and as the residents have gone through the training, it's been provided for them. So yeah, it's, 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 uh, there's really good access to it here. So the next question asks, are we, are you funded a hundred percent by the state? Are the costs similar to other recovery programs? Yeah, our cost um, or our, our revenue comes from about four different sources. We, we, as I mentioned earlier, we receive HUD assistance. So housing for 35 units are paid for through the through HUD. Um, that brings in about 200 to $250,000 a year. 
all of our programs are our food our SNAP recipients as far as their food service providers. All of our residents are eligible for SNAP assistance, so the the program can offset most of its cost of food, much of its cost for food, not necessarily all of it, but most of it with SNAP benefits. We also receive uh, a con we have each program has a contract through the Department of Corrections, and they pay for. Uh, up to 192 days, we about, about right at six months for persons that they refer to us. They pay us $35 a day, and that's about what our cost is. Uh, and then we receive a, a grant from the Department of Local Government of $200,000. So total income is about uh, $1.2 million in, in uh, state or federal revenue. Um, we don't receive any, we're not a, a medical program, so we're not, we don't receive Medicaid. At least most programs uh, don't. Uh, we're we're looking at maybe incorporating that in some of the programs, but we're not a licensed treatment program. We're a housing recovery model, so we're not eligible for uh, uh, health insurance at this time. Okay, so are you ready? There's a fun question. Um, why does the path to sobriety need to be difficult? Behavior came, change is tough. On, on any level. Whether you're talking about eating disorders, sex, wh whatever. Smoking, it's smoking, weight loss, exercise, yeah, eating better. I mean, um, I also think that it's interesting. Um, it's a journey to, and it's addiction journey, but it's a journey for recovery as well. Like, why would we think a one-time thing um, and and it does work for some people, but I, I just think it's a journey like life itself. I don't know. What are you all? I think uh, uh, people that suffer from addiction <clears throat> are trying to cover pain. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to stop using because they don't want to feel the pain. And I think that's the hard part is finding that motivation and that willingness to unpack these emotional issues that have hindered them for so long. And anything worthwhile is, is going to be hard. Tony, you want to add to that? I, I hope it's not too long of an answer, but uh, growing up, um, and, and I, I'm not blaming anyone. Um, my parents separated when I was three and divorced when I was four. And basically I'll just cover it by, you know, say that, um, that addiction is the opposite of connection. And it was really important for me, for myself to, and it, I couldn't see it immediately, but to go back and look where those disconnects began to happen. And um, I'm a tall guy, I always have been, but really skinny guy. And when I had hair, I either looked like a black Q-tip or an Urkel prototype with these glasses and just really socially awkward. And, you know, the alcohol made that awkward guy go away. It made the, the fact that my parents were divorced go away. And, you know, that became the solution. You know, that was the answer. And, you know, the literature talks about how the, uh, um, could no longer differentiate the truth from the false. And everyone else around me could see it, but I, I really believe that, um, you know, the, the, that was the answer. And so, you know, believing a lie for so long um, and then surrounding my pe myself with people who continued, um, who would fortify that lie, um, but they were in the same state that I was. And so to, um, to begin to kind of break that up, to be with people, as Nicole so eloquently spoke to, um, to be able, Maybe I'm, I'm not even involved in a conversation, but man, that stuff was getting in and it was breaking through. Uh, maybe I'm not the one whose behavior is being confronted, but the love and the care with which the, the questions and the behavior was addressed. And then to take the recovery principles and wrap that around that. And the, you know, and the learn from other folks that you, you know, when you're addressing behavior, you're not addressing a human, you're not attacking someone. It's really out of love, care and concern. Um, and how the, the peer mentors and the facilitators um, 
taught us that it was our responsibility to manage that environment and hopefully to carry that on as a facilitator to teach others how to, um, that our job was to manage the environment of the, and the spirit of the model and not to manage someone's personal recovery journey. It was just, uh, uh, you asked me what time it was and I told you how to build a watch, but yeah, it's just an incredible thing to be a part of on, on, on all ends, all aspects. Well, thank you. That like helps um, connect with with that experience. I think for the audience. Um, but another question: Do you have help for family members, or is there anything that you all offer for the family members? Yeah, Tony and Nicole, you can answer that. Um, we do offer a family program. Um, what we do is we have it once a month on a Saturday. Um, our clients sign up for it. Um, we have a facilitator that was trained by um, a family therapist, but the morning session is just for the loved ones, whether it be parents, husbands, wives, whatever. Um, and during that orient orientation, they learn about the disease concept. Um, they learn about what they're actually doing while they're in the program and why they do the things they do. And then we prepare lunch, serve lunch. And then the afternoon session is when we bring in the client with the families. And they uh, there's a person to mediate and they're just allowed to get things out. Um, it, kind of an explanation for the, the pain and hurt that they've caused. Um, and it's been really successful. We are looking at um, opening up um, a family program for just random members of the community to participate in, or maybe someone that is originally from this area went to another program away from here and they come back. Um, I think making sure that families are on board and have a, a real understanding of their disease makes for a better outcome every time. Yeah, I think we also try to encourage all of the family members to attend Al-Anon. Uh, Al-Anon is an extremely important program for family members and uh, because uh, we know that these men and women are leaving the program, going back to sometimes very dysfunctional families. So if the, if that family can get involved in a program to help themselves, it's going to certainly help that their loved ones' sobriety. Um, another question is how can you talk a little bit about how multiple agencies work together to make the program work? I, I touched on that. It, it, part of my presentation, um, it's critical that we have other agencies because we can't do this on our own without the, the support of the health department, the hospitals, our workforce development folks, our GED folks in their educational system, um, volunteers, AA and NA members in the community that'll sponsor our men and women. Uh, all of that is just so critical. Um, uh, to to the to the success of our program, we every member of the community is um, is a vital part of this 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 program. And it's interesting when we when we first opened these programs, many of the communities pushed back at us. They didn't want these people in their community. Um, the NIMBY issue came up over and over again. Now we we always won. We ended up winning the every battle we had. But, and now the programs love us. They can't. They 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 look out, look for ways that they can help us, whether it's church or civic organizations. They they give back to us. They donate clothing, food. Uh, they want to volunteer in our programs, and uh, it's it's really grateful for that. Tony, uh, Nicole, would you like to add to that? I think that um, if there is a service that we cannot provide we will find them that service within the community. And, and we collaborate all the time with other nonprofits um, like Matthew 25, the health department, um, um, men mental health agencies. Um, Tony? Matthew 25 is an AIDS, AIDS program, I believe, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, uh, that, there's also um, a vast resource of people in the recovery community who can help provide those services too and, and, and outreach and, and redirection and, and just, uh, I, you know, um, I'm not a parent, but um, oh my goodness. Okay, Blue, hold on. <laughs> um, but yeah, to, um, to, to, yeah, to teach folks how to be better parents and, and better employees and, um, and, and just a better family and just better family members and how to be a better uh, just human being. Well, one thing that struck me about the model, and I mean, maybe I have this wrong, but the way that your programs connect with agency level programs um, in the community also is helpful once you leave the program. You already have those connections. You already know how to negotiate. You already know how to find help. It's like you've broken down those barriers because it's really hard to sometimes reach out for help or the burden. So is that is that is that still true? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a good point. Well, that's all the questions. Well, thank you. I guess that brings us to the end of this grand, grand rounds. Uh, I want to thank Mike and TK and their guests for an excellent pr presentation and discussion. And we'd also like to thank all the attendees for joining us today. Um, and we will close the session now. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.